Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marta Rustic, Digital Strategist for Campaign Legal Center. I want to welcome you to our Twitter Spaces conversation, Five Ways Secret Spending Enters Our Elections. In a moment, I will turn things over to our moderator from Campaign Legal Center, Adav Nodi. If this is your first introduction to CLC and you want to learn more about our work advancing democracy through law, including how we're working to promote greater transparency around the way U.S. elections are funded, visit campaignlegal.org. If you're a member of the press that wants to get in touch with us about what we've discussed today, email media at campaignlegalcenter.org. Before we get to our conversation, I would like to invite our listeners to share questions for our experts today. If you would like to ask a question related to today's topic, please tweet at CLC. Our handle is at Campaign Legal. You may also want to send a direct message to Campaign Legal Center here on Twitter. We'll get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's conversation. If you are listening live today in the Twitter app and would like to turn on captions, you can click on the three dots in the top right-hand corner of this space and choose Turn On Captions from the drop-down menu. Lastly, we are recording today's conversation so you can revisit it later. For everyone joining us live and checking out this recording at a later time, thanks so much for listening. I'd like to turn things over now to the moderator of our Twitter space today, Adav Nodi. CLC's Senior Vice President and Legal Director. Take it away, Adav. Thanks, Marta. Um, and it's great to be here with you um, to talk about transparency around money in our elections. So there is a lot of money in our elections, and the reasons for that are probably a topic for another Twitter space someday. But within that system, with a lot of money, um, one of the fundamental premises is that voters have a right to know where the money is coming from and where it's going. They have that right under the Constitution, and they have it under federal laws that have been on the books for 50 years. And one of the main reasons for that is because a lot of the money in the election system gets spent on advertising. And it's really important that people are getting served with these campaign ads on their phones or on their TVs or where, wherever they're coming from to know who's paying for them, right? If I see an ad that says, you know, Senator so-and-so is really evil, now how do I know if that's true? Well, if the ad is paid for by an organization that I trust or that I agree with, I'm going to evaluate that ad very differently than if it's paid for by an organization I don't trust or I don't agree with. So the, the special interests that pay to run these election ads, they know this, right? And sometimes they go to pretty significant lengths to hide their identities or to mislead viewers for exactly that reason. And when secret spending is used to pay for campaign ads in that way, we call that dark money, right? Because it, it hides information from voters and ultimately, it makes our, elect, our, our, our election system more vulnerable to corruption and manipulation by those special interests who have lots of money and are hiding their identities. So today, what we're going to talk about is how specifically does dark money or secret spending get into elections, right? When we talk about financial disclosure laws being on the books for 50 years, and still there are hundreds of millions of dollars in dark money getting into the system. How is that? How is that even possible? Right. So, um, joining me today to talk about that are some of my fantastic uh, colleagues at Campaign Legal Center: Aaron Klopak, Sarav Ghosh, and Patrick Llewellyn. Aaron is our Senior Director of Campaign Finance. Sarav is Director of Camp Federal Campaign Finance Reform, and Patrick is our Director of State Campaign Finance. Um, and thank you all for being here. So let's let's kick things off with the first way that that the secret money finds its way into elections, which is through spending by special interest corporations, specifically corporations that are sometimes called 501c4 organizations. It's named after the section of the tax code that created them, sometimes just C4s for short. They're, they're nonprofit corporations, but they get a tax break on their income 
in exchange for that, they're limited in their legal ability to spend money in elections. So Aaron, um, if I could start with you. you know, so I said there, there's laws on the books that give voters a right to know where election money is coming from. So how are special interest corporations spending money in elections without voters having any way to know where that money is coming from? Thanks, Adav. Um, you know, I think to understand the role of nonprofits in funneling secret money into our elections, we have to go back about 12 years to the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United versus FEC. And as I'm sure many listeners recall, that's the decision where the Supreme Court said corporations have a constitutional right to spend, well, corporations and, uh, and unions have a constitutional right to spend unlimited amounts to influence elections as long as that spending is totally independent from candidates um, that are being supported. And, you know, people may have thought that that decision would lead to big election spending by major corporations like Coca-Cola or Exxon. Um, And I should note the Supreme Court essentially promised in its decision that whoever the corporations were that were spending money on elections, that spending would be transparent, disclosed, we'd know where it was coming from. But what we've actually seen in the decade or so since that decision is that um, what it's really led to is the use of the nonprofit um, organizations that Adab was just describing, um, often with vague or even misleading names being used as a vehicle for wealthy donors to conceal their identity as the source of big money on elections. Now, how does that work? So these nonprofit organizations claim tax exempt status. Um, They operate as, you know, a social, what's called social welfare organization. And under IRS rules, they don't have to disclose their donors, Um, but they can engage in a large amount of the same political activities that PACs, um, whose primary, whose principal purpose, sole purpose is um, engaging in election spending. Um, But for these C4s, the caveat is that at least technically political spending can't be their primary focus. That doesn't mean they can't spend millions or hundreds of millions of dollars on elections. It just can't be their primary focus. And even that requirement is not really seriously enforced by the IRS. Um, And then at the same time, we have a federal agency called the Federal Election Commission, which is the agency whose primary, whose sole responsibility is administering and enforcing campaign finance laws. Um, But that agency is also notorious for failing to enforce a parallel requirement that groups who do have the major purpose of influencing federal elections have to register and report with the FEC, disclosing the sources and recipients of their spending. And so the upshot of all of this is that many C4 groups can behave basically like a PAC except they're not subject to the disclosure requirements that apply to PACs. Um, And this makes C4 is a really attractive vehicle for people who want to spend big money to influence elections, but don't want to be identified as a source of that spending. And I'll just note, I think maybe five years ago or so, I recall that there was an article published, I think in the Washington Post that described some of, you know, talked about the influence and and the um, power of some of these big C4 players and described one group called Americans for Prosperity as the third biggest political party based on just the scope um, and scale of its operations and spending. Although it's, you know, important to, to, to note that this is not a partisan phenomenon. There are big, powerful C4 players in our elections on both sides of the aisle. Um, And they're particularly attractive, as I said, because they can get away with spending big money without having to disclose their donors. Although I think, as we'll discuss in a moment, this isn't just by giving money to C4s, which directly spend money on elections, they're also used um, as a vehicle for concealing the source of big donations to super PACs. Right. So thanks, Eric. So so picking up on that last point, then you you have you have these these corporations that are spending money directly on elections and nobody knows where they're getting their money from. But you also have these same corporations taking in money from donors and then giving it to super PACs and super PACs supposedly have to disclose their donors. But 
in this sort of situation, all they're disclosing is that they got money from the corporation and nobody knows where that corporation got its money from. So that doesn't seem like it's really much of a transparency solution at all. If anything, it, it, it has one more layer between sort of the voter and the spender. Patrick, what are, what are your thoughts on this? So it gets a little more complicated here because the groups spending in these instances are required to disclose their donors. But let's take a step back to understand how disclosure generally works for these groups. Both federal and state PACs must regularly disclose all of their spending and all of their donors. Federal PACs to the FEC, of course, and state PACs typically uh, must report all of that information to state agencies. Super PACs, that is federal PACs that can only spend money independently of candidates and can't coordinate with or give money directly to candidates, like the 501c4 groups Aaron talked about, can take unlimited amounts of money from a wider selection of sources than candidates can, including corporations. And of course, that means that super PACs can accept funds from 501c4 groups which as we were just talking about, don't have to disclose their own donors. So in a way that's become increasingly popular in recent election cycles, super PACs may disclose their donors, but avoid any real transparency uh, because they are in fact getting much of their money from 501c4 groups that disclose nothing about their donors, which leaves voters just as much in the dark about who is spending big money to influence their vote as if those 501c4 groups had directly spent the money on election ads themselves. But as you said, Adab is really just adding another layer uh, to the secrecy. And because super PACs can raise and spend unlimited amounts, uh, an unlimited amount of secret money uh, can flow into elections this way under the guise of transparency. And it's worth noting that anti-transparency super PACs are used to influence both state and federal elections. Although federal super PACs are federal committees that register and report to the FEC, we've seen super PACs that spend all or most of their money on state elections, such as governor's races, funding everything from attack ads to outside consultants. Okay, so we have these special interest corporations that are taking money from unknown donors and spending it directly on campaign ads. We have the same corporations that are taking money from unknown donors and giving it to super PACs who buy the campaign ads. Either way, you don't actually know who's paying for those ads. Um, but there are other, there are other tricks, right? Besides nonprofit corporations that can be used to get, pretty serious amounts of money into elections while still hiding the original source of that money. Um, Saurabh, what, what's another, what's another way, uh, what's another trick that, that donors use to keep themselves hidden? Thanks, Adav. Yeah, so another method that is used to keep uh, electoral spending secret is that wealthy uh, special interests, whether that's individuals or corporations, uh, sometimes funnel contributions through intermediary entities. And that could be uh, almost anything. They could be a vaguely named shell company, uh, an LLC, or some kind of a trust, uh, about which there's really very little publicly disclosed information. And this kind of scheme is known as a straw donor scheme. Uh, and it's an illegal tactic that drives secret spending. So essentially the way it works is when the wealthy donor or, or company wants to avoid the public disclosure of their identity, of their connection with the contribution, they can either establish an intermediary entity like an LLC, or sometimes they, they choose to repurpose one that uh, was previously used for something else, something completely unrelated. Uh, often, you know, a, a good example would be like uh, an LLC that is used to hold a piece of real estate uh, or something like that. So what happens then is the true contributor then provides funds to that intermediary entity for the purpose of having that entity make a contribution 
to a super PAC. And when it does so, it does so in its own name. So the super PAC is reporting a contribution from the intermediary, and that leaves the true contributor concealed. They don't appear on the super PAC's disclosure reports. So when the super PAC makes its report to the FTC and the public is able to see it, all they see is that the super PAC got a contribution from an LLC or a trust uh, or some other intermediary. And it tells them nothing about where the money actually came from, where, where the money originated. And one thing I want to emphasize about this particular trick or tactic is that it is already illegal. Uh, what I've just described is a violation of federal campaign finance law because there's a provision in the Federal Election Campaign Act that prohibits the making or accepting of a straw donation. Uh, and there can be penalties for both the person making the contribution, the, the true contributor hiding their involvement, their connection with it, as well as for the super PAC, provided that they actually know of uh, the fact that the money is coming from someone other than the named contributor, which is actually just uh, a straw donor. The catch, of course, there's always a catch, is that straw donor schemes are by design hard to detect. The whole idea is that a company, uh, particularly as uh, companies are now allowed to make contributions to super PACs. Uh, earlier, Aaron uh, discussed briefly the Citizens United decision. And so since that decision, corporations and, and uh, unions are able to make unlimited contributions to super PACs. So it's very hard to separate the legitimate, the bona fide, contributions that super PACs can accept from those that are, in fact, uh, merely straw donors. Those are being used to conceal the true contributor. So, for instance, if you look at a super PAC's disclosure report and you see a very large contribution, let's say a, a six-figure, even seven-figure contribution from uh, an LLC that doesn't seem to have uh, any, anything out there about it, uh, some obscurely named company like the, the Shine Right Cleaning Company, LLC, you don't really know off, off the face of it whether that's a straw donation or if it is, in fact, uh, a real company that's using funds in its general treasury to make a contribution exactly the way that uh, the Supreme Court somewhat optimistically uh, suggested companies would do. So this is one of the things that our group, Campaign Legal Center, spends a lot of time looking into. You know, is is a contribution from an LLC or other uh, company? Is it uh, bona fide, or or is there really nothing out there uh, about this company? And are there other red flags that suggest this is in fact a straw donation? So that brings us to the other catch, which is enforcing the provision of federal law uh, that this tactic violates. The Federal Election Commission is well known, many of our listeners are probably well aware that they have been mired in, in gridlock and dysfunction for years at this point. And so they very seldom seem to enforce the law, particularly in uh, close cases. And they have a track record at this point of not enforcing the straw donor ban against these LLC or other straw donor schemes um, in recent years. And so although we filed numerous complaints raising this allegation, it's really unfortunate that the FEC doesn't at least make the preliminary uh, finding necessary to investigate it further. Um, one of the reasons why this type of scheme could actually be uncovered quite, quite easily is because it leaves a paper trail. Uh, you often see people emailing each other about the transactions needed uh, behind the straw donor scheme and and the bank transfers themselves often leave a pretty clear picture of what's actually happened and uh you know some some recent instances of really egregious illegal conduct uh, have been in the news involving this type of straw donor scheme uh, some of you may have uh, read about the convictions of Lev Parnas and Igor Fruitman. These are two foreign nationals who used an intermediary company uh, to illegally contribute $325,000 to a 
pro-Trump super PAC. Uh, that's that's not only is that you know a defeat for transparency using a straw donor scheme this way, uh, but in fact the source of the money is itself illegal because these these two are foreign nationals, which uh, violates a different provision of federal law. So the uh, the basic idea is that you know we we don't want and voters are harmed by uh, the use of straw donor schemes to conceal who the money is actually coming from, who's the true source of the funds. Thanks, Jeff. So that's I mean, so so we we have uh, uh, money being routed through intermediaries in violation of federal law, a law that nobody is enforcing. We have money going through corporations that aren't supposed to dedicate themselves to campaign activity, but they are, and nobody's enforcing that. Um, and then we have other, you know, other, other schemes that conceal where money is coming from that maybe aren't violations of existing law, but take advantage of gaps in existing law. And a lot of these situations, we're talking about laws that are, that are decades old and come from a different era when, you know, reporting campaign finance information meant, uh, you know, type <laughs> typing some numbers on a piece of paper and stapling it and mailing it to the Federal Election Commission, not the not the modern era of of multi million page um, campaign finance reports through Act Blue and Win Red. So, Aaron, I think you were going to talk about one particular way that uh, that that big spenders say who want to play games with existing law uh it can exploit some some sort of old timing provisions to make sure that they can spend money without anybody knowing it until after the election right um so you know all packs including super packs um as we've already talked about a bit are required to comply with the basic rules for registering with FEC, reporting um, the sources and recipients of their spending, and they're required to file those reports on fairly regular intervals. Um, they can opt for filing on a quarterly or monthly basis, um, pack to file on a monthly basis, also have to file reports before and after a general election, and those that file on a quarterly basis file these pre- and post-election reports. Um, for primaries as well as generals. In recent years, what we've seen is um, these groups, which do have to report, have come up with a crafty way to exploit these alternative filing schedules to avoid disclosing information about their election spending when an election is approaching. So basically, if they're scheduled to file um, on a quarterly basis, they can switch to filing on a monthly basis so that they don't have to file a report before the primary. And, you know, this may seem all technical, and it is, except that basically these groups are gaming the system that's designed to facilitate transparency and provide information to the public to do precisely the opposite. Um, you know, they're switching when they disclose information so that they don't have to make those disclosures. Um, a sort of related phenomenon we've seen is PACs that um, basically wait to set themselves up until close enough before an election so that they won't have to file reports disclosing, um, you know, where their money is coming from until after the election is passed. Now, obviously, or I think it, it should be obvious to, you know, most people that if the, whole, the benefit of having this information about who is paying for the ads that these groups are funding is so that people can take that information. And as Adab was describing in the beginning, evaluate the messages they're receiving. If an ad says, you know, such and such candidate is a terrible person or he's, you know, um, abusing his children, that we can you know, assess how credible those statements are based on who is paying for that ad. When we don't have that information until after the election has already happened, its utility to, you know, voters has really diminished, if not completely um, evaporated. And so withholding that information until after elections completely defeats the entire purpose, or at least a substantial aspect of the purpose of requiring it to be 
disclosed. And, you know, one of the things like a very specific sort of example of what they do is we've also seen groups that kind of hold themselves out as local entities um, when in fact they're completely funded by, you know, major national organizations. So this can be, you know, not only withholding of information, but but overtly deceptive um, and misleading. And CLC has specifically asked the SEC to address this problem, both in the context of enforcement where, you know, the, the behavior actually violates existing law, but also to clarify its regulations to make clear that um, or to address the problem of switching the timing of filing in a way that deprives voters of the crucial information that they need to make informed electoral decisions. Thanks. And speaking of depriving voters of information and sort of archaic laws, I mean, one of the one of the other major categories of non-transparency that's happening right now is in the digital arena where we have laws written 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, before there was anything remotely resembling you know, digital advertising as we know it today. Um, and they, they are um, really designed for you know, the television radio era. And it's led to quite a bit of confusion about what exactly advertisers who use these digital media are supposed to to uh, report about who they are and who's paying for their messages. And, and it seems like that's been the subject of some exploitation. Um, Patrick, you, you have um, uh, details about that? That's right, Adab. And you know, I think when we look at uh, federal law, uh, it's clear uh, you know, where some of those inadequacies exist uh, for digital political ads. Uh, under existing federal law, uh, certain ads uh, called electioneering communications are subject to transparency requirements. These electioneering communications are ads that run close to an election and identify a candidate, uh, but don't explicitly say to vote for or against that candidate. But there's a big gap in this federal law. When these types of ads run on TV or radio, as you said, uh, they must include a disclaimer statement indicating who paid for it and whether it was authorized by a candidate. Uh, these statements often sound something like, this ad was paid for by Group Y and is not authorized by any candidate. However, if identical ads run on a website or social media platform, those ads are not subject to the same disclosure requirements. And even when federal law requires online ads to include these types of disclaimer statements, such as ads that explicitly say to vote for or against a candidate, those requirements are not uniformly applied to online ads uh, in the way that they are to other forms of media. The lack of cohesive regulation for online advertising has led to a wide variation from platform to platform when it comes to disclosure. Because essentially, in the absence of coherent disclosure regulations from the government, the platforms themselves are setting the disclosure rules. And that's an issue because these are profit-driven businesses. So their primary goal isn't protecting voters and ensuring transparency, uh, but profit. Even without strong or cohesive regulation of digital political ads at the federal level, though, a number of states and localities have taken steps to ensure digital political ads for state and local elections are brought into the light. Several states have updated their laws to ensure that digital political ads are subject to transparency requirements, and some places require digital political ads to be made available for public review. These types of reforms uh, that ensure parity for digital political ads can help us achieve real transparency about who's spending big money on elections, which will mean more government accountability less influence for wealthy special interests, and less political corruption. Well, at least some, some progress on, on that front. Um, so that's, I think that's kind of our overview of the, the main ways that we're seeing money get into the election system without anybody knowing where it's coming from. Um, and we are happy to take questions uh, on any of these topics or, or related topics. Um, if you have a question, just, just tweet it at campaign legal to at campaign legal um, or, or DM 
campaign lingo, whichever you prefer. Um, and one question, um, paraphrase a little bit, is uh, so a lot of talk about the Federal Election Commission not doing its job. Um, haven't heard a lot about Congress so far. I mean, these laws are presumably written by Congress and uh, Congress could change them, update them, uh, fix them. Um, what is happening, if anything, on that front? Um, Sarab, you want to take that? Sure, happy to. Thanks, Adav. Uh, as far as transparency goes, there is probably one uh, marquee bill in Congress, which uh, has actually been around for a while. Uh, Senator White House introduces it, uh, I think, in almost every Congress. And this is the Democracy is Strengthened by Casting Light on Spending in Elections Act. Uh, if you want, or if you want the acronym, it's the Disclose Act. And the goal of this bill is to essentially shine a light on a lot of the secret spending that we've been talking about, particularly the, uh, the large volume of money that is spent by these corporations uh, that are tax exempt under uh, one of the uh, 501c sections of the federal tax code. And so basically the bill would require that any group that spends more than $10,000 during an election cycle uh, has to disclose the sources of its money, has, has to disclose its donors. Uh, as, as Aaron and Patrick mentioned earlier, under current uh, law, these groups can actually, uh, they don't have to disclose their donors. And in fact, they can spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on elections, either directly uh, purchasing ads or by uh, directing money into political committees that are themselves purchasing ads. So these groups uh, can actually have and do have a huge influence on our elections, but uh, currently there is you know, no, no real requirement uh, that, that requires them to disclose their donors, the Disclose Act would fundamentally change that. And um, so it's a bill that we uh, at CLC, we advocate for every time it comes up. And uh, hopefully at some point in the near future, Congress can actually get behind it and, and pass it into law. Right, because you know, to the extent the problem right now is that if you run the money through enough intermediaries, uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it obscures the original source from the public. Um, you know, so a, a law that would require that money to be traced back through the intermediaries uh, would, would ensure that that information comes public. Uh, you know, regardless of, of the attempts to, to conceal it, which would be great and would solve a significant percentage of what we talked about today. Um, the other and the other question that I'm seeing um, relates to sort of the other kind of culprit here, which is the, the Federal Election Commission. Um, a lot of talk, uh, a lot of talk about um, the FTC not enforcing rules, not updating rules. Aaron, can you, can you talk a little more specifically about sort of what it is that the Federal Election Commission could be doing? Um, even if Congress doesn't pass a new law, could could be doing to address uh, these these gaps uh, in enforcement and in the current transparency rules uh, that it's that it's not doing, but but could. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that question, Adav. Um, so I think we've hit on um, examples of this during our conversation um, today a bit. I think you know the FEC. Um, was designed by Congress to um, require some level of bipartisan agreement to do um, most of its, all of its substantive actions, most of the things that it does. And the idea behind that structure was to make sure that um, this agency that operates in, you know, an area of politics is not engaging in decision making on a partisan basis. But what we have seen over, you know, many years at this point, is that um, decisions may not be made on a partisan basis, but they certainly are being made on an ideological basis. And half of the commission is 
consists of commissioners who don't believe in enforcing the laws that they are um, put, that they were confirmed in their roles to enforce. Um, and so we have, you know, matter after matter, complaint after complaint, where no matter how well documented the facts may be, the commission cannot agree and routinely deadlock to even on the most preliminary question of whether there's a lot enough information to open an investigation and explore allegations of um, unlawful activity a bit more. And this is, you know, this includes allegations that a group spent millions and millions of dollars to influence elections. This includes, um, you know, examples of groups that even have leaked internal materials that say, you know, our goal is to, um, you know, make sure that this person gets elected. And, you know, you sort of name the situation and it seems like commissioners who don't want to enforce the law will come up with some explanation um, not to enforce it. And as a result of that, the commission isn't investigating even, even situations where the law that already exists makes clear that the activity alleged and supported with factual evidence is unlawful. Um, you know, that problem could be addressed by reforming the way that the commission operates, I mean, by, well, by appointing commissioners that believe in enforcing the law um, or by reforming the way that the commission's enforcement process works so that the commissioners, three commissioners don't have the power to prevent enforcement. Um, but then on the on the rulemaking front, too, I mean, I think, you know, as Sarab was just talking about, certainly some of our campaign finance laws, um, the statutes themselves are out of date, and it requires legislative action to fix some of the gaps. But there are other things that um, really just require, you know, that are within the power of the FEC to address um, and and could be addressed if they could agree to do that. But we see the same sort of dysfunction in the um, rulemaking context as well. And that includes, you know, there's a petition for, there's a they're pending rulemaking about updating commission regulations to account from the way that advertising actually works online. Um, that has been pending, I think, since 2011. So for, you know, over um, 10 years. And, you know, even in that time that the rulemaking has been pending, the um, technology has advanced and advanced and the FEC just, you know, can't even um, reach agreement on kind of minor clarifications of, of things that should be pretty non-controversial. So, um, so I, I would say, I mean, certainly, certainly there um, is action that requires um, steps by Congress, but there's quite a bit that could be done with um, merely just having an agency that was willing to do its job. Right, and and the FEC is getting sued left and right for not doing its job, right? Getting sued for not enforcing the law, getting sued for not updating the law. And, um, I think a, a lot of that is playing out in the courts right now. And, uh, there there are there are some courts that seem pretty willing to to uh, hold hold the FEC to account. Um, for, for really not not accomplishing anything of any substance in the last 10 plus years. Um, so uh, and then that's despite that's despite you know poll after poll showing that when you just ask the public, uh, you know disclosure of money in politics is consistently supported by majorities and super majorities you know, across the political spectrum. Um, so s some hope for, for progress there on the congressional front you know, and, and the public front. Um, and, and on that note, um, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to thank Aaron and Sarav and Patrick uh, for, for joining us to talk about transparency and uh, making sure that we can find out who's spending you know, large amounts of money to get politicians elected into powerful offices. Uh, if you want to to learn more about protecting the rights of voters, visit campaignlegal.org. If you're a member of the press, email us at media at campaignlegal.org. Um, thanks for joining us. And don't forget to make a plan for when and how you are going to vote. Thanks very much.